Merry Christmas! Welcome to Walden Community Church. My name is David Kenny, and today I'm going to be telling you the Christmas story, welcoming you into this first week of Christmas Advent. Our theme this year is Peace Has Come. Because I just felt like, you know, at the end of 2020, we could really use some Christmas peace. Our gospel Christmas story comes today from Luke chapter 2. It says, in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped and swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it and wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. This wonderful Christmas announcement, peace on earth, and goodwill toward men. That'll be on Christmas cards in our mailbox this year. It'll be in the Christmas carols that we sing. Christmas is the time when we all long for a little peace on earth. Wouldn't that be nice? I think living uh, through 2020, we could all use a little more peace on earth. What do you think? How, how was your year? Uh, did you host? Did you host this year uh, Thanksgiving? Did, was it complicated to find out where everyone was going to sleep? Did you have out-of-town guests? Did you have to figure out where we were going on which day? And, and you make those phone calls. You say, are you guys all coming here? Or are we going there? Who, you know, where are we going to put all these different beds? Does anyone have a gluten allergy? <laughs> right? The holidays can be complicated. Do you know what else can add to the complication? Politics. <laughs> What's the holiday rule when family comes over? We're not going to talk about religion or politics this year, right? How did that work out for you? Because for 2020, it was all politics. It was all divisive. Do you know what else can make things complicated? Divorce. Which house are we going to? Whose family is doing what? You know what else makes things complicated? Money, or really, the lack of money. And we look around at everything and think, how are we going to afford all of this? Everybody sing, it's the most wonderful time of the year. Well, it's supposed to be, right? Tell me something. Where is the peace on earth? Christmas is a time when we all long for peace on earth. We, we just read the Bible story of the angels. And they said peace would come as a result of the birth of Jesus. In the Old Testament, one of the titles used by the prophet Isaiah for the coming Messiah was the Prince of Peace, which is why peace is one of the main themes at Christmas. But it doesn't matter. Regardless of what season is on the calendar, countries will still stand in conflict, nations will still be on one side of the line or the other. Uncles and aunts and sons and daughters will still all see things differently than you. And yet, the Christmas story keeps calling us back to that dream. Peace. What do you think? Can peace be real? One day, could there really be peace on earth and goodwill toward men? I think we watch Christmas movies and we get a little nostalgic. 
They might even make us complain about how things used to be. But I think if you remember Christmas time during the Depression, or if you remember Christmas time during one of our major world wars, you would probably agree that those who experience Christmas today should be thankful for what we have now. But where can you go to find peace? I haven't seen anybody offering peace for sale this year. Uh, you can buy a lot of great things on Amazon or eBay, but I'll bet nobody is promising to sell you peace. I mean, true, Christmas can exaggerate all the bad, like we just talked about, but it can also point us to the good. And hopefully, Christmas guides us to the most incredible realization of all, and that is that God sent his son to be the focus of our lives, so that no matter how dark or how noisy things get, Christmas can help us focus on the peace. And that peace can make a difference in our lives. No, the only place to find peace is from the Christ child that the angels announced all those years ago. And Jesus paid a price for peace. I mean, sure, he paid a price. You know, while our human race was in rebellion against God, he came to us as a totally vulnerable little baby, born to impoverished parents who had traveled far from home. So I want to talk about peace this season, and also not that we should look forward to peace as if it's some goal out there in the distant future, but rather that peace is here. Peace has come. The angels proclaim, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. We hear that word, peace, and we think of two fingers raised. We think of a patch that's on a hippie's jacket. We think of peace as the opposite of war. We think that peace is where there is stillness instead of noise. But is that really peace? The angel said that Jesus brings peace. So I guess the question is, why did the world need peace back then? So let's take a look. Now we get four Christmas stories uh, from the book of the Bible, and they're called the Gospels. And more specifically, within those four, we really only have two. Uh, we have Luke. Luke tells the story of the shepherds that we just read. And we have Matthew, who tells us the story of the wise men. Mark starts his gospel off with Jesus' baptism. So there's not really a Christmas story there. And John's gospel is, well, it's different. It's different than the other three, which is why I felt perhaps we should start with John this year. Why John? Well, John would have been a person who understood why the world needed peace. When John writes his gospel story, he's about 70 years old, which means he had lived a long life, which meant he also knew hardship. John knew loss of all the disciples. He was the only one who died of natural causes, which means John watched all of his friends die. John saw poverty. He saw starvation. He saw plagues. He lived through the Roman occupation and their war against the Jews. In that war, he saw a million Jews killed, and he saw God's holy temple destroyed. John saw his people sold into slavery. He lived through Emperor Nero, quite arguably the worst Roman Empire uh, to ever exist, led by the worst Roman emperor who ever lived. But more than that, John was also a man who knew Jesus. When Paul, when Paul writes to the Galatian church, he says in chapter 2, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Paul's describing meeting Peter, James, and John. And he says, 
These guys are the pillars of the church. Uh, they're, they're the supporting beams. They are the, the thing that everything else sits on. And, and why wouldn't he be? John was part of Jesus's famous inner circle. When we list uh, the disciples, we always start with Peter, James, and John. In fact, John was such a strong believer that even though he had lived through everything I just mentioned and seen all those horrors, he is still able to write these words at the very end of his gospel. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. A man who is now 70 years old with all of the sadness that he had seen for his life, his own life, uh, people that he knew, property that had been destroyed, no matter how bad the world had become, John still believed that Jesus was life, that Jesus was the answer. John says Jesus was life, spiritual life, eternal life. Okay, so what does that have to do with Christmas? Well, everything, if we believe that Christmas is about peace. Do you remember that on the cross, Jesus gave Mary to be John's mother. In John 19, it says, standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, this is John, standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Which means, not only did John walk with Jesus, through his own lifetime, but he spent the rest of Mary's lifetime listening to her stories. John would have known everything there was to know about Jesus. He would have known everything there was to know about the Christmas story. He would have heard the story of the wise men and the shepherds over and over and over. So how come John doesn't start his gospel with angels and shepherds and a manger? There's not even a Christmas star in John's gospel. Well, Listen to how John does start his gospel. He says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. John starts his gospel much like the story of Genesis with those same words, in the beginning. And it's in those first creation stories we know that the first thing God does is he makes light. Because before that, there is only darkness. And for John, who is a genius, right, he adopts that same theme in his writing. Only this time he argues that the world is still in darkness, and that it's not until Christmas that we have light. You see, in order to talk about peace on earth, it's important to know that before peace came, the world was dark. Before peace came, there was a shortage of peace. The world so desperately needed peace. John the Apostle was exiled by the Roman Emperor Titus Flavius Domitius in the year 95 to the island of Patmos. And all through John's life, there had been death and doom and hopelessness and darkness. And then he sits down to write this story about Christmas. And he begins with the words, in him was life. Can you imagine? That's a lot of pressure for a brand new baby, born in a dark time, born in a highly politically charged time, born during a busy census, born in a crowded, loud city, born in poverty. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased.
John also knew about the peace that Jesus brings. And he recorded Jesus' words for us. Jesus says in John 14, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Our nation had a lot of internal struggles this year. We had a volatile election with civil rights issues, poverty, racism, disease. Plus, it seems like we're always disagreeing about what we teach in the classroom, who can marry who, how we treat our elderly, how we treat the sick, how we treat the planet. Where is the peace for us? Where's the peace for the United States of America? Where is the peace that comes with the banner, One Nation Under God? Where's the peace? Some homes are even war zones, all to themselves. Maybe you know what that's like and you grew up in one. Where's the peace? Where's God? In English, the word peace conjures up a, a passive picture, one showing the absence of civil disturbance or hostility or a personality that's free from internal conflict. But the biblical concept of peace is much larger and much more dynamic than that. Peace in the Bible literally means to be complete. It means to be sound. You know the Hebrew word for peace. It's the word shalom. It's a verb that conveys both dynamic and static meaning. Shalom means to be complete or whole, but it also means to live well. Shalom like aloha, was used in both greetings and farewells. It was meant to act as a blessing to the person you spoke it to. When I say shalom to you, what I mean to say is may you be filled with health and prosperity and victory. Jesus uses this word when he's talking to his disciples. He says, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have shalom. In the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. That's a bit confusing, isn't it, that language? Jesus admits that the world is turbulent. He admits that there is kind of a, a war going on. He uses these words like defeated and overcome, and yet he says he brings peace. That's because everybody who thought the Messiah was coming would be this champion this war hero, and so with all of the darkness and the Roman occupation and the poverty and the disease, perhaps people like John originally thought that Jesus would come and he would rescue the Jews. But Jesus didn't come to rescue the Jews. And he also didn't come to punish Rome. Just like the angel said, he came to bring peace. He came to bring peace. Even at the end of his ministry, his own followers, they're still confused, and they finally ask him plainly. In Acts 1, it says, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. In other words, the disciples ask, now, now is the time for war? Is it now, Jesus? Is now the time to rise up against our oppressors? Now the time that we can put our foot down and we can take back what's ours? Is this the time that our nation is going to be a nation again? And Jesus says, no. In fact, Jesus says, I've already done it. I've already done the thing I was going to do. Right? He says, I've already overcome the world. In other words, peace wasn't coming. Peace wasn't on its way. Peace has come. Jesus says, now your job is you're going to take this message and you're going to go outside these walls, outside these borders, and you're going to take this good news to every city, every nation, every country, every continent. Can you imagine how confused these disciples must have felt? What do you mean peace is here? You already overcame, the war is over, and, and now you want us to go and tell others? What peace? What are you talking about, Jesus? We were promised peace. 
And peace comes to us through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Isaiah prophesied about Jesus, said that he would be the Prince of Peace. In Isaiah 9, verse 6, the prophet writes, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Isaiah prophesied that Jesus is the one who brings peace in the fullest sense of wholeness, prosperity, tranquility. Jesus brings peace. Shalom. But is this peace between me and you? Is this peace between this country and that country? The Apostle Paul sheds a little more light on this. Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, For he himself is our peace, who made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Peace breaks down walls. This is what peace does. Peace breaks down walls. And, and before we get too far ahead of ourselves, we should go back and ask, well, what is, what is Paul talking about? Who, who made us both one? And, and who is the who? Well, it's the Jews and the Gentiles, right? Ladies and gentlemen, there is a lot of forces in this world that are trying to divide you. It's true. The world tries to divide you by age, by gender, by appearance, by intelligence, by economic status. And the temptation for us today is, well, I'm just going to hang out with other people like me. I'm going to hang out with other people who agree with me. I'm going to hang out with other people who look like me, who talk like I talk. Paul says, Jesus broke down the wall of hostility. Jesus, through his example, his life, shows us the path toward peace, and it is with our fellow neighbor, he said. In fact, Jesus even taught us that we should find peace with our enemy, right? How does he break down the walls? By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. So making peace. Peace unites us. Peace unites us. See, Jewish law favored Jewish people. And by doing it, it excluded everybody else. It was a private club. And you know, one of the most hurtful things that you can do to someone isn't what you say. It isn't even how you treat them. But rather, it's ignoring them. Exclusion is extremely hurtful. To not be invited, to not be allowed in, that hurts the most. Jesus died to abolish all the Jewish laws that kept people on separate sides. And when Paul says one new man, he means you are now all on the same team. There's no more private clubs. There's no more secret handshakes. There is just peace. Verse 16 says, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Peace brings God close. And that's the most important one. This is the truest form of peace on earth. And this is what Christmas is all about. This is what the prophet Isaiah was talking about. This is it. This is the answer. We have been reconciled to God by the cross. Jesus killed the hostility between who? Us and God. Jesus didn't defeat Rome. Why? Because Rome was not our biggest problem. Our biggest problem was sin. Our biggest problem was where we stood with God on a day-to-day -day basis. The old temple sacrificial system was broken. 
It was a government system, and it was limping along, and it would never really work. Sacrifices only covered our past, but we needed perfect blood that would cover our present. We needed a perfect lamb that would forgive even our future. Where were we going to find a lamb like that? How could we possibly slay sin? How could we destroy that enemy? Who could kill sin and grant us access to the Father? Who could unite us and bring us shalom? So here comes Christmas. Poor, outcast shepherds, they're out watching temple sheep, sheep destined to be sacrifices, out there on the edge of town eating moldy bread, unmarried, broke, poor, uneducated. They had very little cell phone coverage. These men who were never invited, never included, never allowed in, never a part of what was going on. And suddenly, they receive the greatest invitation of all, black tie event, exclusive event. And the angels began with, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy. For who? For the Jews? For shepherds? No, that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. What does Jesus save us from? The emperor? From Caesar? From war? From bloodshed? From disease? No. He fights the ultimate battle between good and evil, and Jesus says, I have overcome. He is our Savior from sin. Peace has come. Listen, you've already tried everything else. Isn't it time you could try a little peace? Even the psalmist saw how simple and how powerful a message that peace was. Psalm 34, 14 says, turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Why say pursue it? Because I don't. I don't pursue peace. I am not peaceful by nature. I am hostile. When the disciples questioned Jesus, they said, is now the time to defeat Rome? I am ready to fight. We humans, we don't pursue peace naturally, do we? That's not the first thing we think of. Right now, there's probably more people in my life who I am not at peace with, and they with me. It says peace on earth. That's what our Christmas cards will say this year, peace on earth. But am I doing my part in this world of darkness? Am I following the light? John writes at the very beginning of his Christmas story, in him was life. That promise is life for me. It's shalom. It's completeness for me. But that means I also need peace. I need peace. Not just with others. Not just with God. I need peace for myself. I need the peace that will calm my heart. Colossians 3 says, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. Listen, it's a very simple test. Do you feel better than or less than other people? If the answer is yes to either of those, then you need more peace to rule in your heart. Without peace ruling your heart, you might feel like you don't have anything to offer or that the bad things in your past define who you are. Christmas peace will help you give up those toxic feelings. If you have hatred in your heart for other people, Christmas peace will help you give up that idea that perhaps you are inferior or less than other people. We need to learn how to find peace for ourselves. I'm reminded of a correspondence back in the 1900s between Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass. Douglass was pessimistic about the future of black people and whether slaves would ever be set free. 
Harriet Tubman wrote Frederick Douglass and asked this one question. She said, Frederick, is God dead? Now, you might not think that you ever could change or that your life could be different. You might not think that it's possible to find peace in your heart. You could look at the mirror and you could just decide, you know what, this is me, this is who I am. I am beyond help. My question is the same. Is God dead? You could say, ah, you know, I can't handle work anymore. There's too much drama there. It'll never change. Is God dead? You know, I've been stabbed in the back so many times. I don't know if I can trust another man. I don't know if I can trust another woman. Is God dead? The answer to the question is no. God lives. God lives. So you, in your own heart, give it up. Give it all up. Give, all, give up all your attitude of superiority. Give up all of your attitude of inferiority. Give up all of your pain. Give up all of your disappointment. Give up all of your mourning. Give up all your attitude. Give it all up and allow the peace of Christmas to rule in your hearts. You know, it's easy to deceive ourselves and we'll think that we can only find peace after we have worked through our to-do list even if it's a really good list. You won't find peace at the end of that list. We tell ourselves that we'll find peace if we make enough money, successfully raised our children or grandchildren, paid off the house, paid off the cars, paid off the bills. Maybe after that, we'll find a little peace. Maybe after I understand all the mysteries of the Bible, I'll have some peace. What have you told yourself that you have to do before you can feel and know and carry peace. Because before you go back to your list, I want you to go back even further to Christmas and to realize that peace is already here. Peace has come. Allow it. Allow the peace of the Christ child to rule your hearts. He is alive. And he came into this world to change us, ourselves, our relationships with one another, and to restore us to the King. Dear Lord, in a world where worry prevails, stir up in us that good news again. This Christmas, make it real in our hearts. Never have we needed your joy and peace more than now. Thank you for the gift of Jesus, our Emmanuel, the Word made flesh. Forgive us for forgetting that your love never changes, never fades, and that you never abandoned the purpose for which you came to save us from our sinful condition and to give us life eternal the joy of relationship with the Holy God. It was your birth, it was your death that sealed and settled this promise of peace forever. We pray for joy in our hearts, hope in our God, love to forgive, and peace upon the earth. We ask for the salvation of all our family members and friends. We pray for your blessings on all people May there be bread for the hungry, love for the unlovable, healing for the sick, protection for our children, wisdom for the youth. We pray for the forgiveness of sinners, the abundant life in Christ. Holy Spirit, fill our hearts with your love and your power and the peace that is only found in Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks for coming over today and spending some time with us. Merry Christmas. I hope you have a blessed holiday and a wonderful new year. I'll see you next week.